Okay, hi everybody. Um, just, first of all, thank you, Nancy, for sorting this one out. I'd um, just like to introduce Nancy, obviously, for those of you who don't know, which I'd be surprised if there's anybody who doesn't, massively, massively respected in the wine education world. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's been a master of wine since 1995, so <laughs> long time. <laughs> uh, and along with lots of other businesses, she's been a regular presenter for at Leith's Wine School for the Wine Scholar Guild. She was a director of Christie's Education Programme and a consultant for the Oxford Wine Company. And of course, now she is an ambassador for the Vini d'Alto Adige, uh, which is why she's here today. And so we know that this is going to be extremely educational and I suspect right on point. So thank you very much, Nancy, and please go ahead. Well, thank you. I think Jessica, um, of IDM, who represents the Consortium of Vini Alto Adige, uh, may have wanted just to say a very few words. Is that right, Jessica? Yeah, just a few words. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to say I already love your group. <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you for your interest in, in our wines and our region. Today we will experience and explore what amazing benefits and influence Altitude has on our wines. And, um, and that thanks to Nancy, our Alto Adige wines expert and master of wine. For the ones who have never been to Alto Adige, this is an official invite to come and visit our wineries in our, in our region. Uh, we are here for you. And yeah, then let's begin with this beautiful tasting, Nancy. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Well, I think very first of all, I need to say that I'm extremely conscious that I uh, became a, a, an MW in 95, mm. and therefore there are many other uh, new recruits who um, are much more up to date about so many things. Um, as I age, I become very conscious that uh, one can only begin to really specialize in certain areas. You cannot hope to cover the global thing. So um, I say this because I'm particularly conscious of some of the people who have very kindly agreed to or decided to turn up today. So um, I'm thinking particularly of Wink Lorch and Robin Kick, for example, um, who are specialists in their own fields of uh, Jura and uh, Switzerland, respectively. And I think Michel Shah may be turning up, who's also an expert in, in uh, the northeast of Italy. Um, so really what I want to do this morning is, um, I guess it's by way of providing a, a focus point um, for the, the sort of study, the research that I've been doing recently. And I would like to be able to uh, sort of put it before a friendly, educated group of people, uh, because quite a lot of it uh, is certainly new to me, and it certainly seems to be quite new to the viticultural world too. Some of the papers that I were reading were published two and three months ago. Uh, so, um, and I also need to make a disclaimer that I am not a chemist. And so it's difficult enough for me to pronounce some of the names, let alone understand all the true pathways. But what I hope to do is to collate um, quite a lot of the information and perhaps provide pointers and indicators where if you're interested, you might want to pursue. Um, I could, I'm saying this rather rashly, but uh, put together possibly um, a, a bibliography, a sort of list of some of the ones that have been of most interest I felt and, and, and have informed this, this talk. So um, uh, I, really it's in the context. I mean, Jessica's already said, please do accept that invitation because it is truly one of the most beautiful places in the whole wide world. And that's saying something to all of us who have the opportunity to go and visit um, so many wonderful places. But um, it is a fascinating microcosm and it's why I think it's really worth our time examining. Um, in the South Tyrol, and for, I have to just also caution here, uh, two languages particularly are spoken here. It's Italian and German. And so we flip between South Tyrol and Alto Adige, and they are one and the same thing, okay? So uh, it can get confusing at times and signs rather like in Wales are in both languages. But, um, 
In this region, the mean annual temperature um, since 1920 has increased by 1.9 degrees centigrade. And I think it's worthy of examination since it's a much larger increase than the global average, which stands at 0.89 centigrade. Um, so less than one. So it's basically more than double. Um, so it's worth examining what's going on here. Um, it's also worth recognizing that this is one of the very smallest growing regions, certainly in Italy. Um, it has only 5,500 hectares, which is um, by way of approximation, uh, really very similar to that of saint Emilion. So we're talking tiny. Um, and as a result, under EU regulations, you're only allowed to increase your area of planting by 1% every year, which means that in Alto Adige, they can only plant an extra 55 hectares every year, which means that you jolly well want to get them in exactly the right place, which is why they've been doing so much uh, recent research to focus on finding the perfect terroir, the perfect height uh, aspect uh, ratio. Um, so from 2017 to 2018, well over half of the new plantings, small as they were, uh, were over 500 meters above sea level. And in 2018, 12% of the new plantings were even higher at an altitude of over 800 meters. So um, that is the background and the context. Um, I make no apology now for going through a little bit of sort of positioning um, of exactly where we're talking about because, partly because of the two different uh, languages, it's an area that still seems to uh, be a little bit fuzzy in the wider public's uh, in knowledge, certainly. Um, and here it is just up on the border of Austria and Switzerland, which explains its Germanic uh, background. It was in fact until 1919, 1919, in other words, just after the First World War, it was part of the Austrian Hungary uh, Empire and, and was then absorbed into Italy and has since uh, been its most northerly uh, growing region and uh, province. Um, Bolzano is the capital uh, of it and as Jessica said it has the most extraordinary uh, microclimate because it's surrounded by uh, an amphitheater of mountains, mountain range facing south. So it has the most perfect aspect uh, and it the, the slopes of the, the mountains help to trap the air in the summer. So um, whereas you might have thought that the hottest place in Italy would have been Sicily or Naples or so, uh, actually Bolzano can top that at certain days um, and get over 40 degrees in certain days of the summer. Um, I also just to underline Jessica's invitation, um, it has been voted, Bolzano has been voted several times as the capital as the regional city, the city with the highest uh, quality of life in Italy. And that's a vote by Italians. So I think we should be taking that quite seriously. Um, to give the topographical um, outline, you can see how very mountainous it is. Um, the Bolzano area, if, if you can see my cursor, but is just there at the very point. And um, so you've got the mountain ranges with the snow fields and the waters flooding down. So we have down here uh, the Monosta Valley and down here the Azarco Valley and the two rivers combine in Bolzano and head south towards Verona, which is about a two hour drive south. Um, because the Alps are the youngest mountain range, uh, or certainly amongst the mount youngest mountain ranges in the world, they're still very active. And the Africa plate is shunting into the European plate and pushing them up. And as a result, this small region of Alto Adige has some of the most complex geological uh, features that you could imagine. Um, this is the sort of fault line um, here. We have a mixture of volcanic rock, weathered rock, and sedimentary rock, as you might expect down near the Adriatic. 
um, there. So an immense range here, which comes to play when we're dealing with these small vineyards uh, that we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, the variation is very dramatic in a very small part, in a very small area. Now, just to focus a little bit more closely on the area that we're going to be looking at, this is Bolzano. Um, and I think one of the most um, useful analogies I found is it looks to me like the front of the head of one of those ancient oxes and the two valleys being the horns and the front down the nose of the ox being the Adige river and the valley. It's down here that you get a lot of the fruit growing and indeed this region is one of the most important apple and pear orchards in Europe, but you also have a, a range of vineyards and indeed I'll show you exactly how they're laid out. So um, here is Bolzano, the centre, um, roughly facing south with the amphitheatre of hills around it and the Azarco Valley and the Venosta Valley joining in there. Um, the reddish uh, points here, sorry for the sirens you can hear in the background, it's all here, it's all go here in Oxford. I don't know if you can hear that, so, um, but if you could, you just, uh, I thought you might want to know in addition to the chainsaws. Um, we've got these red uh, vineyards here, and what we're going to be looking at is um, how they're beginning to nudge their way up the valley sides. Um, up here also, I'm going, we're going to be tasting a Gewurztraminer, it will be our third wine um, from the Valley Isarco Cooperative, and they are the highest growing vineyards in the Alto Adige region. Um, not the single highest ones because some of those are uh, found around here, but as a general part, you find they're all white wine producing. So you get this dramatic, unbelievable, wonderfully fantastic terrain. This is a cellar massif, uh, dusted in snow, uh, a low, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, vines there are creeping up. And just to underline, uh, partly because it's so picture skew, as my daughter would say, um, so, so uh, photogenic, but uh, this is the sort of backdrop you get and informs very much what we'll be uh, talking about. So um, in terms of climate, well, uh, because of the Alps and because of the Adriatic and the Mediterranean influence, you have two very different winds coming from very different angles. From the north, of course, the cold winds, and especially as they come down the mountainside um, at the end of each day, uh, a huge diurnal range in temperatures. Um, the warm air currents, which you feel particularly uh, during the summer months, uh, bring up uh, some uh, moist air, but they also keep the air, air circulating, uh, which actually diminishes the uh, incidence of rot uh, and uh, unless things get immensely humid. Um, but it's this particularly large differential between day and night temperatures, which we will also find uh, very pertinent to what we want to be talking about. The vineyards go from roughly from 200 meters to 1000 meters, but as I've indicated already, there are one or two that uh, are nudging north of 1000 even. So, I mean, it is really, it's the most extraordinary part of the world. Um, the climate is pretty jolly amazing and the sunshine um, hours that you get uh, accumulate to something that is uh, less than Barossa, uh, slightly less than Central Valley, California, um, but uh, more than uh, most other New World, uh, uh, or certainly more than any of the Old World parts of the, that we come across. Um, so being on the south side of the Alps helps hugely in maintaining uh, a very clear sky uh, during the winter uh, and uh, wonderful conditions uh, during the summer. Precipitation, um, it tends to be more in the summer. Um, that can be partly not just in terms of um, rain, uh, but also in snow melt, um, which uh, is important and in fact rather alarming. Um, this slide, fuzzy as it is, so apologies for that, but um, was uh, grabbed from uh, a paper uh, uh, 
subsidized and sponsored by Eurac Research um, and in conjunction with the Limeberg Research Institute, which is really key to the agricultural health and innovation of Alto Adige. They are based just south of Bolzano and um, uh, were established in 1975. And they've been working uh, on the temperature rise in Alto Adige and particularly on two projects which I'll mention again. One is the Pino Bianco project, which they've done in conjunction um, with uh, uh, various winemakers within Alto Adige. And one is the Rebecca uh, project, which is focusing primarily on the Pinot Noir and is um, an international one. Um, so here we have two different scenarios. Um, the uh, RCP is the, um, oh God, I had it on the other one, and I always find this one is the uh, registered, uh, da, 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 um, uh, somebody will, will, will chip in, but it's one that, uh, it's the parameter which dictates how much, uh, things will uh, have to change um, if the uh, temperature increases um, by 8.5%, uh, sorry, by 8.5, yeah, or uh, whether it's a 4.5 uh, one. And in which case, um, sorry, I've misplaced my notes on that particular one, uh, but it will, uh, it will resurface. Um, how very annoying because I put it on the other slide. So um, I apologize for that, but the temperature trend, as you can see, has been increasing uh, very, very steadily. And we are here, we've had extremely hot vintages uh, in the uh, earlier part of the year. And 2018 is this outlier here. Um, and if the trend continues, well, we're, we're, we'll lose all the snow at the upper levels. Um, we hope to be able to keep it to this level here. Um, the precipitation is a little bit less uh, dramatic, um, but over this period, um, you can see, A, how much it's already uh, varied and how much it's likely to. Um, it's more to do with snow melt. I think that the concern is as opposed to the actual amount of precipitation, but it's also, as we know from so many other case studies, it's the method in which you receive the precipitation and it's increasing violence um, in terms of the uh, power of some of the summer storms. And of course, in terms of hail, which can have devastating effects. So as Florian Haas, who is uh, both a researcher and uh, vaguely related to the um, Franz Haas uh, family, um, has so uh, trenchantly put it, uh, winter is falling out of Alto Adige. And this slide really gives you an idea of how the snow fields, the snow ranges, is creeping back up uh, the mountainside. Um, so, the altitude of the region surfaces, um, we have the majority of them below 1000. There is plenty more space to go up. But of course, as you go up, uh, the soils tend to get thinner, the slopes tend to get steeper with all of their extra difficulties and costs involved. Um, we're going to be looking at a mixture of wines from usually from just below around the 500 mark to uh, up to around the 800 mark. Um, not surprisingly, the white wines are the ones which occupy the higher altitudes. Um, but Pinot Noir is one that we're going to be focusing on today uh, with the tasting Gewürztraminer and Pinot Bianco. And to my surprise, when I did the reading, Gewürztraminer and Pinot Nero, Pinot, Pinot Noir, um, have approximately the same um, uh, range of abilities to grow in, a, in, in a different heat and temperature and precipitation conditions. Um, 
and it's something that I wanted to underline when we get to talk about the Gewürztraminer. We're used to thinking of Gewürz as a grape that tends to lose its acidity very, very rapidly and can become very flabby. However, um, the Leinberg research uh, has shown that actually it's one of the ones that appears to be most resistant in the face of climate change at the moment. Um, so, Altitude is obviously an important determinant in this. Um, we can adjust the variables to counter climate change in a multitude of different ways. We can choose different ri later ripening varieties, different uh, ri later ripening clones, uh, graft onto later ripening rootstocks. You can raise the trellis, um, all of which is very expensive. Um, you can reduce the leaf area to leaf area to fruit weight ratio. Uh, we can do late pruning to push the uh, bud burst and the phenological ripening back so that the harvest is later. We can crop thin, but when it really comes to it, we really have started to feel the need to look upwards. And this is where altitude can be a really important uh, playing card and of course it's one of the trump cards that Alto Adige possesses in such a small area. For every 100 meters, this is approximate because of course it does depend on what latitude you're on and I don't wish to get bogged down into the discussion about what is high altitude and what is, but roughly speaking, um, you can say that for every 100 me 150 meters you go up, the temperature will drop approximately one degree centigrade. So naturally from that, we will anticipate uh, an increase in acidity and a drop in sugar, and this helps to uh, balance the wines out. But as we'll find when we talk about the wines themselves, um, there are many more, um, subtle parameters that we need to consider and of those I'm going to be particularly mentioning some of the other acidities. Um, the recent research seems to be focusing primarily on malic acid and its behavior as temperatures increase. But there are others and I'm thinking of uh, salicylic and succinic in particular um, which is usually associated with a slightly sort of salty character. And these two seem to be um, more present the higher we go. It may well have something to do with the greater stress uh, that the vines might be under. Again, I'll come back to that when we're talking about our Pinot Bianco. Um, we have this large diurnal range of temperature. I cannot understate, under, overestimate uh, or overstate how important that is. Um, it seems to, I mean, in, in Alto Adige, you can have at least 17 degrees centigrade range from morning to night. Uh, and so much so that it's, it's rather like being in Anderson Valley in Sonoma uh, of California, where you need to uh, bring clothes as if you were to dress for four different seasons. Um, so layering, when you come to Alto Adige, layering is definitely the way to go. Um, you'll need your jacket in the morning, you'll be stripping off by, uh, 11 o'clock by lunchtime you'll be in your t-shirt um, by by the afternoon you'll wish you were in Lake Caldaro which is the uh, lake at um, south of Bolzano uh, reaches 28 degrees centigrade in summer fantastic for swimming and um, yeah very very attractive at that time of year and day but as the diurnal range in temperature seems to increase it not only increases the acidity in the grapes but it seems to intensify polyphenols and this as we will also mention it seems to intensify the aromatic profiles um, it may not um, I thought I should qualify that it doesn't intensify it rather than spread them you get a wider diversity of aromatics on higher altitude grapes the research would suggest um, the increased radiation is also very uh, important, and this is going to be particularly the case when we uh, move on to our Pinot Noirs. Um, 
the UV levels intensity increases by around 10% for every thousand meters gained. And that's a statistic from WHO. Um, and these also have a very dramatic impact on the phenolic characteristics of both the grape skins and rather interestingly, the, the whole combination seems to influence the grape seeds differently as well. Um, the steeper slopes we've mentioned, it's immensely uh, expensive growing grapes up these uh, terraced, often um, vineyards. Uh, it's said that uh, you, for every, even just not a heroic vineyard, and, and Robin um, will know very much what I mean by that, they're vineyards um, that are over 500 meters with a slope of more than 30 degrees. And you certainly find plenty of heroic vineyards in Alto Adige, but by and large, most of them are simply on steep slopes. And by way of comparing the cost of um, or the man hours it takes to work on these vineyards, you're looking at something like 80 hours per hectare for a steeply sloped vineyard compared to 30 hours per hectare of a vineyard that is on nearer the valley floor. So really uh, quite a dramatic um, difference. I should also say that um, the, uh, the um, size of the vineyards owned by the, uh, the 5,000 vineyard owners in Alto Adige are very, very small. On average, they have one hectare. And so it's very much a family affair, um, the combination of, of them. They tend to work in offices and they tend to work their vineyards, often at weekends. Um, so it's been a, a, a way of life as much as it has uh, a means of income. And the majority of the people will give their grapes to cooperatives, of which there are 12 in um, Alto Adige, um, but there are also private estates and conglomerates where they work with individual growers with long-term contracts. Um, fresher, thinner soils will also be important because whilst they're, um, they're less depleted possibly initially in nutrients, they are thinner and therefore less able to withstand any erosion as a result of uh, the violent summer rainstorms. Also, they're more likely to become more rapidly depleted if they're planted with vineyards. And um, we tend to find that in order to maintain the a sufficient quantity of wine being produced from a high altitude vineyard, they plant the vines very densely. And so we need to be careful and mindful of how they are um, working the soil. And again, I want to return to this when we're talking about um, some of the others, because there is very recent uh, research that suggests that some spray uh, on leaf just before Veraison could be really um, influential in maintaining at different acids. Um, finally, uh, more persistent winds is also very important at this area. Um, Alto Adige is blessed with winds. I mean, mostly, you know, they're not like the Mistral. They can be quite violent, but they're nothing like the violence of the, the Mistral that we are familiar with in the Rhone. Um, and it is seen much more as the doctor wind, um, maintaining a constant breeze throughout the vineyard and reducing the amount of uh, rots and such through. Um, so we, somehow we haven't, uh, um, the, the influence of Alto on the composition of the grape is something that we'll, we, I've touched on already. And I've mentioned this higher acidity and it's not just in total. Um, we're looking particularly at tartaric and malic, but also at this salicylic and Sicinic, I mentioned, with its sort of association with salty profile. Abscisic is something that um, 
is a little bit nerdy and I've become a bit more um, interested in um, recently. And I will need just to quickly look at the line because it's known as a precursor and I'm learning as we go along this, um, but it is something that uh, helps to helps the vine to respond to stress. And um, it seems to be linked to a lot of these uh, acid developments in ways that we're not entirely certain of yet, but it might be instructive when we're dealing with wines that have come from higher acidity or when we're analyzing wine from high acidity and assessing whether vineyards, it, it's, it's a valid direction to go in. I'm couching all this in the context of, um, I'm very conscious that on Friday, I believe, um, there's um, a South African talk on extending uh, viticulture into cool areas. And um, this will be very interesting. I think he's going to uh, comment possibly on the highest uh, uh, vineyard in um, South Africa, which is Cedarburg, um, but also mentioned the very cool vineyards down in Agulas. And I think the, you know, we may find that there are similar uh, points that are touched on, but the difference of going upwards is unique, certainly in the UV radiation, and then in, and how that knocks on through the phenolic, the, the phenologic uh, ripening of the vines and the development of the uh, phenologic um, uh, constituents, the characteristics and the antioxidants. Um, Coming through with generally lower pH perhaps isn't so surprising um, as we go up. And that's obviously going to be of importance um, in terms of stability and in long-term aging. Um, the improved freshness and more intense, I mean, I'm slightly nervous about that intense. I should maybe have said greater array of aromatics um, rather than that because um, the jury is still a little bit out on intensity and I'll leave it to you to decide uh, whether you feel it's more intense or whether it's more complex between the two, three pairs that we're going to be tasting. Um, what is interesting is the anthocyanin levels um, and this is a mixture where very little has been done uh, so far on anthocyanins actually within Alta Adige as far as I can see, but a great deal has been done um, in Argentina in particular, and I recognize that they're dealing with a very different beast with Malbec and such, but they have been finding regularly that at higher altitudes the intensity of anthocyanin is, is greater. Certainly one is aware, I think, of a, a more of a blue spectrum that seems to come through at higher altitudes. Um, and along with the aromatic uh, profile, there seems to be a greater range of the volatile uh, compounds. Um, and this includes not just the aromatics, but uh, a lot of it, of course, is um, alcohols. Um, let me move on to other uh, parts of this. Um, we've got um, the higher phenol phenolic content that I, I mentioned, and um, we have also, and I'm sorry for this, just looking amongst my many different papers here for the one that I wanted to show you um, on the difference between um, the organoleptic characteristics, which are the flavanols, flavanols, you see I'm learning as we go through, the ones with an A are the ones that add astringency and bitterness, um, whereas the flavonols uh, will provide more coloring and antioxidants. And these are the ones that are usually me measured. What is more recent, it seems, are the non-flavonoids. And this is a group which um, I think is going to become of increasing interest, not just to us in our, uh, speaking for myself, nerdy, uh, 
enological interests, but in the wider world, because it has uh, really quite dramatic medical uh, potential medical benefits. Uh, because as we go up in altitude, what are known as still beans, and I had to look up how to pronounce that, but I believe that's correct, um, the still beans increase. And the most important still bean is resveratrol. Now, this is one you may well have come across um, because it is one of the main uh, components in red grapes. You'll find it in blueberries. You'll find it in dark chocolate, fat, happily. Um, uh, it is an antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic, antibacterial agent that seems to have a very important role in, uh, by way of an antioxidant in our biological makeup. And it's one of the reasons why uh, doctors, when they haven't gone on the teetotal wagon, um, re uh, recommend that we drink a glass of red wine, particularly every day. It's particularly resveratrol. And I just wanted to underline that because um, I think that could potentially become a very important element in our future discussions. Um, the other thing that would appear to be the case is that the tannins condense and they become more compact. Um, by that, I believe it means it's more stable um, and that might also inform why we also get greater color stability. So um, all of these in terms of um, security uh, and predictability are, are important dynamics. Um, lower sugars is no surprise, therefore lower alcohol. Um, what it should really bring to mind is that within this small area of Alto Adige um, is the necessity to know all the different components that you're dealing with. And they have the ability to blend from many different altitudes, especially amongst the cooperatives um, who may have, very typically they have about 130 members, uh, each one with approximately one hectare each. And they're dotted all over the valley, um, usually in clusters, not surprisingly, in order to be logistically convenient for the cooperative winery. But they have the ability to blend the different plots together. And this should not be underestimated either. So um, I think perhaps now we should turn to the wines themselves. And as we go through, I mean, I'll give a little bit of background about the individual wine and where it is, but I'd also hope to draw in a little bit more of the research um, on each type of grape variety, particularly on the Pinot Bianco and on the Pinot Noir. So, um, if you'd like to pour your first wine, which is the Nals Marguerite, we should pour them in pairs. Um, so we've got the Nals Marguerite, and I will show you the bottle. Um, uh, do I need to stop sharing to do that? I will do that at the end, I think. Um, and I will show you all the bottles. Um, and then we've got the... Um, I should just, Nancy, just to say, people, if you do show the bottle, people can see you because it oh, right. can see you on the right hand side of the screen. So it's not a problem. We can see you. Complete techno peasant. Right. OK, there we go. That's, that's it. That, that's yeah. the first one. That's the Sernian. And this is the Eichhorn from Manincor. OK. Right. So. Um, before we do the tasting, though, I just wanted to ask if there are any um, questions. There um, were. Yes, there were. There's a couple here. Uh, Wink. Um, Wink, do you want to ask your question? Um, OK. Um, just way back, um, Nancy, you were talking about uh, the warmth of, of Bolzano and, and the fact that most of the vineyards are on southerly slopes. I just wondered whether there were any moves to experiment with 
more northerly slopes to as a way of combating the extremes of, of climate change or whether that doesn't really come into things. Right, well, uh, um, my apologies, because if I said that, that I, I was misleading you, because actually the directly due south facing vineyards are relatively rare, and most of them are um, southeast or southwest facing. So they tend to benefit either from early morning or uh, late afternoon. Um, sons. But you're quite right that um, that is one area that they are looking at. In fact, one of our wines is a more northerly facing uh, vineyard um, and, and okay. there's a single vin a vineyard uh, in, in its own right. So a special plot for that reason. Great. So, Thanks. Okay. Um, yes. And there was also Robin, Robin Kick, if you wanted to, there's a question that she had. Right. Okay, hi. Now, I was curious to know, because I've seen in other areas where um, going up the slopes, obviously, are very, what all the points you made are very fascinating about the soil being a bit more um, pure in the sense it hasn't had, you know, it's newer, it's fresher. But other things I've seen in certain other areas, uh, because there's a lack of soil, it can't retain water um, so easily. And so the vine ends up getting quite stressed, which therefore ends up, um, you know, sort of getting blocked and then ends up be becoming much more producing grapes that are much uh, higher in sugar and then higher in alcohol. Because um, I've had that, uh, you know, in a number of cases. Uh, so is that an issue? Because um, it's doing the actual opposite of what people maybe are hoping that will happen. Yes, it would be. And um... Well, given that they are, um, the new plantings are so restricted, so they're only allowed um, 55 hectares every year. Um, one of the things that Leimborg Research Institute has done is an immensely complex um, interactive map, which does altitude, air temperature, radiation, uh, water runoff, humidity, and it's compiled together uh, to try to identify the optimum areas. Um, when those areas have been planted, um, they've found that they haven't suffered from what you've just su suggested, which I, I recognize is a potential problem. Uh, and what they are finding is, as you say, that the vines are under stress because of the slope and the thin soils, the water runoff is uh, quite dramatic. And, and so water stress can be one. And that is why I think this um, focus on acidity is going to become increasingly important. Um, and I mentioned abscisic acid as the precursor phytohormone that um, triggers the vine's stress response and helps almost to peg succinic acid and various others. Um, I'm not sure about salicylic myself, I don't know, but it pegs it at a certain point, um, which seems to be retained. Um, so you're absolutely right, it could all go disastrously wrong, but with the right selected areas, um, they're just finding that so far they're getting the benefit of increased UV radiation and the um, phenolics uh, without so far um, over sugar production. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist in Alto Adige, it does. And you can get very high alcohol wines, even from altitude. Um, I think one of the, the converts that we're going to be tasting is 14%, I believe. Um, and that's not a small, even the Pinot Noir, I think, is 14%. Um, but I, I think the acidity in these cases is still intact. So okay, thank you. Where, where can I, can one find this information, this map? Uh, yes, and I can send it. I didn't put it up um, because uh, it's, it requires so much, so much um, breakdown um, mm, okay. uh, to understand. Uh, and to, to work it out, but it's, uh, it, it, it occupied um, three years of research and I can send it. If you, you can find it actually also on the Limeberg Research uh, website, L-A-I-M-B-U-R-G. 
um, Leinberg and the woman who runs the viticultural part of it is named uh, Barbara Reifer and uh, extremely knowledgeable, helpful woman. Um, so, um, Ellen, sorry, Nancy. Yeah, Ellen had a Ellen had a quick follow on question um, sure. regarding uh, the answer. discussion point from Robin. Um, yeah. If you can't unmute uh, Ellen, I can ask for you. It was really that um, that she was saying that presumably the organic approaches such as green cover help the problem of water rain off. Yes. Um, um, and how big is organic in the region, and is the interest uh, growing in that? Um, the interest is growing. Organic is tiny still. I mean, it's less than 10%. Um, but Manincor, that was the second wine that we're going to be tasting, is an example, not just of organic, but biodynamic producer. Um, they, it, it's an interesting um, uh, construct, the region of Alto Adige sociologically, uh, because so much of it is uh, in such a small area is, is made up of cooperatives. And you, you might think, well, on the one hand, that's just going to make slow everything down and, and uh, change will be very reluctant. Um, but I have to say that in the cooperatives that I've talked to, uh, I've been most impressed uh, by how avant-garde, uh, certainly the, um, but a management uh, committee is and how um, well they incentivize uh, the members and so rather than it being seen as a hindrance to uh, changes um, it is and I believe and has been and will be a really positive force in the change towards sustain <clears throat> excuse me sustainable and more towards organic uh, production but certainly sustainable is what they are. They have a new agenda that came out in um, last year uh, uh, with their agenda to 2030, by which time they hope to be fully sustainable. And I should also um, highlight that the, um, the consortio, the, this um, website, the consortio of Sud Tirol of Vino, Vini Alto Adige is immensely useful. It's got so much information um, that you could spend hours um, crisscrossing it in various ways um, and, and really a very good place to start before you come uh, to, to visit Alto Adige. So um, perhaps just very briefly before um, we, we go on to that, I might, might just sort of summarize some of the things that I've said about um, altitude. Um, some less surprising than others. Um, so with altitude, obviously you get higher acidity. What we're also discovering is that you get a different types of acidity that don't um, react in the same way as we're used to at lower altitudes. And of these, we particularly need to focus on the more, most recent has been on malic and particularly looking at succinic and then the phytohormone um, abscisic. Um, you have longer ripening days, which of course I, I hadn't actually concentrated on, um, but that means you get the longer um, hang time and better physiological <coughs> ripening, and that's where the organoleptic properties um, come from. Um, you get higher acidity, uh, brighter fruit, you get um, clean fruit because there's less um, humidity from lower down and less rot. Um, and you, therefore, you can do different types of fermentation. Whole bunch fermentation, for example, is frequently um, done for ones that are higher altitude, um, partly because the skins are more intact, the wind helps to thicken it, the dryness uh, up there during the growing season, um, you end up with thicker skins, um, higher levels of, again, phenolics and smaller berries, which also intensify, um, also contribute to darker colors. Um, and uh, compact tannins, concentrated flavors, um, and the whole evolution of the yearly cycle has been um, pushed back, which is often a good thing in order to avoid the worst of the dangers of frost, which obviously tends to collect lower down. 
Um, the negatives are that it's very expensive to work. I mentioned 80 hours per hectare compared to 30 hours per hectare as a rough guideline. You get um, lower yields per vine, um, which is why many of them intensify their planting regime. And um, the hail, you know, when it hits is worse at altitude. And of course, this can set you back not just one year, but two years if it's also damaged the actual vine structure itself. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's have a look at some wines, shall we? So, um, so our first one um, is Nals Marguerite Winery. This is Pinot Bianco. And um, this is uh, this particular winery did take part in the Pinot Bianco project that uh, Leinberg uh, coordinated, and um, they uh, identified that different aromas at different uh, at higher altitudes or varying altitudes, and it's under this especially that the mis the malic acidity has become um, so uh, apparently important. Um, they say, and others will understand this much better than I, but that a, a good, one that is recognizably good by a, a panel of blind tasters, um, they've identified should not exceed a sugar malic ratio of 88. So for those of you who are winemakers, I'm sure that will mean uh, a great deal more to you. Um, uh, the uh, cystic acid is the other one that I mentioned. Right, so, um, and the one that we're going to compare it against, um, this being at 500 to 700 meters, um, we're going to uh, taste it with the Manincor, which is based uh, near Bolzano, very near Bolzano, at around 300 meters and is the biodynamic uh, producer. So um, while we taste the first one, let me tell you a little bit more about Nal's Marguerite Winery. Um, it was founded in 1932. It has 138 families and 160 hectares. So that's just over one hectare on average per person. Um, but they're spread over 14 uh, different sort of sub regions in the vicinity um, uh, of Sermia. And you can see where number one is pointed. So in 14 different regions around here. Um, so this gives them a great range of flavors. Um, and this particular vineyard, um, the Sermian, is, is on a wide range of different um, uh, rocks, uh, all of uh, different drainage. And, uh, but the um, thing that might also be of interest here is that the grapes are trellised on most of the grapes in Alto Adige um, historically were on pergola. And during the 1980s and 90s uh, improvements, which was very uh, dramatic, um, a lot of them switched over to the GEO system. Um, but in my last visit, a lot of the winemakers were saying, actually, they're not sure um, that they would rip out the pergola these days because of its shading potential and the way it protects from sun. And um, so it's with regret that they're finding that they need to take out the old vines and replace them. Um, so some are beginning to experiment, but uh, by and large, the predominant um, trellis system is GEO throughout. Um, what they're, sorry, I'll let, you, I'll let you taste quickly. So this has had a um, bit of uh, pre-fermentation maceration. Um, it's been kept in very large, fermented in very large oak wooden barrels. They do experiment, no, I shouldn't say experiment, they do use acacia um, barrels. It's grown locally um, and traditionally they would make barrels out of it. Uh, it's of interest in more and more wineries, especially those of high altitude ones in the Azaka Valley, are using um, acacia regularly because it seems to have two attributes. One is that it's very neutral, but it has a slight, uh, imparts a slight waxiness 
uh, to the texture of the wine. Uh, and so it has a softening mouthfeel, but it doesn't interfere with the fruit flavors. And, um, and yet it still has all the other benefits of, of wood aging. Um, this, however, was in, in oak, and um, the aging on the lees um, for a further eight months is another very uh, important element, uh, particularly within the Pino Bianco uh, production in Alto Adige, um, and has been proven to uh, produce wines of immense aging potential. Um, the vineyards around uh, Terlan and, and um, the cellar, the cooperative of Terlan, Terlano, um, has wines that go back 30 years and have, having been kept on their lees all that time. Um, rather interestingly, it was very briefly, I'd say as an aside, um, the winemaker at the time in the 1980s, 90s, had thought they, they would go into sparkling wine, so invested in uh, large stainless steel tanks um, and uh, in which they, they might uh, store or, or possibly even do um, couve clothes. And, uh, but he was out vetoed. I mean, he was, you know, the decision was, was thrown out. So they kept the tanks and they keep them on their sides. They look like large cigar tubes. And in this, they aged the Pino Bianco in particular on the lees for many, many years. And it's extraordinary, the, the freshness with which it comes out. Um, anyway, these were hand harvested in mid-October. So there we are at 500 to 700 meters. Um, the harvest time has been pushed back to mid-October. We get wonderful ripening conditions during that. But as a result of the long hang time, you've got full physiological um, ripeness. And um, it is the phenological timing which is so clearly driven by altitude and is a, a real bonus. Um, right, um, that one, I think, you know, it. it it does, it's got a high level of acidity, I mean, the total is 6.6, .6, but it's got um, a full malic. So malic as, um, mallow was not completed. And um, I think the uh, aroma that comes from, you might get, you know, white blossom, but there is something that's very distinctively, um, they put pink grapefruit in their note. And I was struggling to find what it was. And as soon as I read that, I thought that's exactly what it is pink grapefruit is that slight right bitter element. Um, so nice clean linear structure, rather crystalline character. And, the, and I found a very sort of racy finish on that. Um, we should compare it um, with, just by way of, of interest, with um, a Pino Bianco from uh, several hundred meters lower, 300 meters. Um, and let me go back to the map just briefly to show you where we are. This is Manicor, just south of Bolzano. Bolzano is sort of just to the right of the five. So this is Manicor, and they are fully biodynamic. Um, and they it's been a vineyard, I and mean, there's been a, a sort of vineyards there since 1608, and in the um, Enzenberg family, uh, finally through marriages, etc., since 1978. And the current incumbent is Count uh, Michael, um, since 1991, with the most piercing blue eyes, um, almost um, Paul Newman like. Uh, and um, absolutely passionate about the biodynamic um, principles. Man in core, um, as I hold my hand over, is it actually means hand on heart. Um, that's their uh, moniker. So um, everything is done uh, completely uh, naturally. They only use spontaneous fermentation with natural yeast. And this is another element which um, I wanted just to sort of touch on very briefly because again, very recent um, research, building on others, of course, but are the different microbes that you find in vineyards anywhere, but also at different altitudes, and how this informs the phenolic uh, character of the grapes. And then again, the transformation when you make the wine of 
other phenolic characters um, uh, if you're using particular yeasts. And all of this could be said to really be one of the main indicators of terroir, um, or certainly something that we should consider. Um, then it's been uh, matured in a mixture of different sizes of oak barrels and, and on the lees again. Um, they do have their own barrels from their own forests, of course, the way one does, um, but uh, primarily they're using um, French and Austrian oak for this. Um, the winery is gravity fed and is really a bit of a work of modern art. Um, none of the concrete, and it is largely concrete, was prefab. It was all uh, poured in situ and it's been done in such a way so there's a sort of sleeve of air surrounding it. It's sunk into the ground, so it's predominantly uh, below ground um, with a, a, a barrier, a, a curtain of, of air between the rock and the concrete, which acts as a natural air coolant, uh, in addition to which they have their own um, heat exchangers and um, so that with the geothermal heat that they can extract and use during the winter and the heat exchanger that they can use, they can keep very steady temperature in the winery um, throughout the year. It's a very intelligent ventilation system. So um, let's have this much riper um, aroma. Certainly the um, Pino Bianco uh, study seemed to suggest that, and again, it's not rocket science, I would say, but um, that you get the broader, riper apple levels uh, or aromas on the lower, um, on the lower altitudes. Um, and obviously all of this affects the sensory profile. Um, let's have a taste of that. So we've got 13.5% alcohol compared to, oh, they're both exactly the same. Supposedly. Although I must say I'm feeling a little bit more warmth perhaps on the finish of this. Um, and you get a slight tannic mouthfeel possibly from um, the oak and the uh, skin contact. Um, it's vibrant, but it's interesting. I, I would like to put to the boat um, if there's a preference between them and um, whether well, uh, maybe we'll do that at the end because it will get complicated otherwise. Um, um, but, uh, Anthony, Robin was just asking a quick question about the Pina yes. Biancos. I think you said they don't go through malolactic. Um, the the Manicor has. Right. Um, but the um, uh, Niles Marguerite has not. Has not, no. And she was asking about if there'd been any analyses done on the alternative acidities like the succinic, et cetera. Yeah, not on these specific wines, I'm afraid. And uh, I mean, that's, you know, as I say, this is sort of like um, beginning to put out a stall of things to discuss. Um, maybe next year or you know, soon after, we might be able to do that sort of analysis and comparison. Um, but um, they haven't um, haven't got the breakdown of those particular things for these particular uh, wines, um, unfortunately. Um, yeah, just a quick comment, because I found the first wine, which is at higher altitude, to be much saltier than the second wine. Exactly. So, so. that's why I, I was curious as well, because it's like, wow. Well, well this here. is very much, I'm so delighted you said that, Robin. Thank you, because this is exactly the point, is that, um, uh, it, you know, whereas I, I cannot actually present you with the breakdown, but I know from the research that has been done more generally, both in Alto Adige and elsewhere, that succinic acid is one thing that seems to increase with alcohol, with um, altitude, uh, partly because of the stress, stress natures that we, you, you know, we were just discussing. And um, 
and whether or not it's directly linked, and, and, and I really will need others who are far more chemically savvy than me uh, 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 to work out whether abscisic acid also has a role in this, um, being the precursor of the sort of to trigger all the stress uh, responses. Um, what's, what you, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I say what you say is interesting because in Burgundy, white Burgundy, over the, these last few vintages that have been really hot, a lot of the wines are much saltier that I feel than they used to be, which go. is adding freshness, which is great because it adds balance. But that's what's so fascinating because I was yeah. talking to a producer about this and he had a feeling it had to do with the fact that there's a lot less malic in white Burgundy. Um, and it's that, that the lower, the lower malic uh, naturally, because it's right, you know, riper. Yeah. Um, and then therefore the, a lot of them aren't finishing malolactic because there's so little malic anyway. Yeah. That had something to do with it. But what you say with different acidities makes more sense. Well, <laughs> it, and, and, you know, again, this is, a, a, you know, I'm, I'm looking through a a glass darkly because um, and so this isn't my background at all but it would in, perhaps make sense if you know Malik is dropping off as, as we it wouldn't be surprising um, uh, that others maybe are stepping in to compensate and that's where this um, abscissic trigger um, is beginning to bring about the increase in things like succinic and and that and um, at first, you know, I first started looking into it because I was, um, you mentioned the, the Greek wine, Nina, earlier. I mean, I, I thought the Assertico wines are so fabulous. And I thought, oh, it must all be due to volcanic soils and things like that. And then if you, you look more into it, and actually, um, Olivia Zint Humbrecht has done a fascinating talk on the different acidities. And I should really go back and, and it, it's on, it's on um, recorded online. Um, uh, but I really need to go back and listen to it six times over so I properly absorb everything. Uh, but that he's noticing traits as well within his biodynamic uh, vineyard of Zinfenbrecht um, in Alsace. Um, so I'm, I'm only sort of, uh, I suppose, really sort of flagging a few things up um, rather than properly being able to answer anything. I'm just sort of trying to draw things together um and uh, yes um and and all your comments are super helpful because um yes I, it, you know it's it it helps to connect the dots a little bit i think um anyway um I, i'm also now conscious i'm uh, sorry i'm rambling, but maybe we should just move on to our second two wines um which are the gewurz uh so we've got the izako and um Um, and this is from a, a cooperative, actually the youngest cooperative in Alto Adige. It was established in 1961 and they've got 135 members, so all roughly the same um, sort of size. Um, um, again, compared to a private owner. So as with the Pinot Bianca, we've gone from a cooperative, the first wine, to a private owner, the second wine. And this private owner is Elena Valsh. Um, extraordinary producers really um she started uh elena started uh, actually as an architect and then married into an old winemaking family and then sort of seems to have taken over and and made it um her own um and their gewurz this is from a single vineyard the castellats um above the village of tramin which is of course so legend has it the gewurz Tramin uh, is where the Gewurz grape is supposed to have come from, although I know that um, Jose Guillamos has perhaps traced it back to somewhere near Stuttgart. Um, but um, uh, Wink might uh, have something uh, to say because I believe there is a, a, a historic viticultural link to the Savonian grape in Europe. Shall, shall I, shall I um, just respond and just say that um, Jose Riamos would um, endorse this because he has instilled it into me that Savignan is not a cousin of Tramina. Savignan is Tramina. End of story. They are DNA identical, uh, and it's there's more and more evidence. Although even the Jurassians don't um, believe this, 
that probably it originated in the Jura, um, sort of came out of the woods there um, in the great book from Janice Julia and, and Jose, it's called a, a founder variety. So Gewurztramina, of course, is a variation of it. Um, so I don't know how to answer that and whether the variation first arrived yeah. in Tramin, who knows, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, they are one and the same um, genetically. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, there we go. Thank you very much for that input. And as we know, Savignon um, uh, holds itself very well in, I mean, with acidity and longevity and such, which might inform the somewhat surprising um, um, empirical results of Gewurz in Alto Adige, um, Barbara Reifer of the Leinberg Research Institute I mentioned, would love to get more people growing Gewurz because it seems to be far more resilient to climate change and far more adaptable to many different growing regions. But the market isn't there, so, not surprisingly, growers are reluctant to plant. Um, but let's um, have a taste uh, first of the Aristos um, Gewurz. This is their sort of upper line of, uh, of wines. And um, it is an amazing place to visit. You're up a tiny, very steep sided um, valley. And um, <laughs> The, the marketing manager is, is, is a battery of, of energy and looks a little bit, I'm hoping, you know, I'm sure he wouldn't mind, but in the nicest possible way, looks a bit like Billy the Wiz. Um, and he moves like that. He's very, very swift and decisive and a brilliant um, ambassador for the, for the cooperatives. Um, anyway, the age of the vines isn't immensely old. Um, but we are dealing with a really very high level. Um, at this level, they also um, do grow Silvana and Pinot Bianco. Um, and then even higher, um, they grow Kerne with very, very good results. I mean, it's completely transformed my impression of that grape uh, from having tasted it only really in, in UK and Germany. And, and they also grow Mulaturga with equally successful results. Um, so they're the really cool climate, high altitude ones. But the Gewurz here, um, after very delicate crushing and, and short skin contact, um, stainless steel, no malolactic again, and then seven months on the lees. And then they always keep their wines back for uh, several months, at least four, before they release it, because they feel that's important to uh, blend all the uh, components together. Um, they, even at this level, very steeply terraced vineyards, it's still Guillo, um, and the harvest here began in early October. They're almost always the latest in the region. Mm. Very attractive, delicately scented. Um, what is it? Mm. Well, I won't put words into your head. I'll let you think of it yourself. Mm. Interesting, from a very delicately scented aroma, I was getting things like rose petals, but without it going um, in a, uh, over, overwhelming in that rather unattractive way. Um, but on the palate, it's really intense, dry, it's very focused, um, compact, quite sort of coiled um, uh, energy, alert wine, um, and a slight, very light sort of spice. Um, I think that no mallow, also evident there. It's got that steely sort of driven style um, to it, and yet it's got 14% alcohol. So your comment, Robin, is, um, is noted, but then Gewurz has the ability, doesn't it, to um, ripen high levels of sugar. I'm just gonna have a quick. Um, and then um, rather swiftly turning, um, to the Elena Valsh. Uh, it's a, a, a Gewurz from a single vineyard. So they've got two single vineyards, which are a bit like Grand Cru. Um, in fact, they're struggling with this nomenclature right now and trying to work out how to 
put some sort of logic on the rules and regulations given that uh, Barolo's gone one way and Burgundy's another and anyway um, it's known at the moment as a single vineyard um, a very precisely demarcated um, it, and it's cartographically recorded that's important um, uh, in order to qualify um, so one of their top vineyards um, let me show you on the map once more so here we are and so we're east facing here and behind it what I wanted to point out is what's known as the Mendela mountain um, range has been cut off because of the delineation of this map, but um, it goes up to about 2000 meters um, and it's immediately behind this vineyard uh, and this brings down, not surprisingly at nighttime, the diurnal range of temperature here is extraordinary and the cool air comes down so it snaps the ripening process closed and preserves the acidity um, and uh, so it seems to be coping well but the difference in the color is very apparent isn't it uh, between this sort of round 350. Um, it's much lower these this vineyard but the vineyard is very very steep um, 63 degrees apparently I am reliably told by um, uh, by the marketing department at the Les Navages. Um, but this does have, um, uh, lovely, right. it's, it's perhaps not um, so lively, the aroma, it's weightier. Maybe that's not surprising. And um, the total acidity is um, is uh, is lower. Let me just have this five point five. Gosh, it's terribly difficult keeping all these papers in order here. Yeah. So the total acidity for the Izarco from Arist Aristos from Valley Izarco was six. Uh, grams per litre at 14 alcohol and this is 5.5. Um, still got a freshness though to it which I find extraordinary given what we're used to thinking of with Gewurz um, and it does seem to be one of the characteristics. Um, I don't know whether it's because we've been talking about it but I'm also finding something slightly salty in this um, and uh, I, maybe I should pledge to come back in 18 months time um, and see if I can get a complete breakdown of wine so that we can make that direct comparison um, between actual different types of acidity, um, not just different components and flavors. So um, the other benefit of this particular vineyard at Elena Valsh is that um, it has strong winds. That's partly due to the cold air coming down from the mountain, but it's also um, in the main valley. Uh, so you get the Aura, O-R-A wind that comes up from the Adriatic. Um, and again, it's all geo uh, system, but the vines are very close planted. And this is partly what um, you were mentioning, I think earlier, I think was it Robin who was saying um, for extra shading um, and, uh, and the, yeah, so it, it uh, cools and they get lower yields from this um, uh, at 38 hectoliters per hectare, which is really um, saying something. So, um, Again, are there any questions? Because I, I, I could go into um, some little um, side discussions, but I think having looked at these time, unless there are any questions, we'll go straight on to our Pinot Noir and um, taste these two side by side. Now, I'm not sure that these are going to do what I thought they might do in terms of colour. I shall be interested to know um, what your feeling is, because in the bottle, um, so, and I should just be quickly showing you, this is what the Aristos Gewurz looks like in the bottle. And this is the Elena Valsh. And I need to rescue these 
scorching there in nice dark bottles, but the sun is beginning to come round. How lovely to be able to say that. Um, so we're now moving on to a very heavy, I'm afraid. This is another thing that needs to be addressed in Alto Adige is to get rid of this overtly extrovert, ostentatious weight of bottle. Um, that has been changing. And the same, this is our last wine. That's the Matson. Okay, so. Um, To make them fair, they are different. The, um, the, the, in terms of color, um, the Saint Valentine is certainly the sort of brighter, uh, but it's more ruby. Um, the other one has more particulates in it. Let me, sorry, go back to um, the map just to show you where these two are. So the Saint Michael Epan, which is the Saint Valentine or San Michele Appiano. You see what I mean about the two different languages clashing is there. And our last wine, the Castelfeda, is the further south down there. Okay, so um, we're dealing with uh, Pinot Noirs that are grown at up to 550. These are south, southeast, and southwest facing. Um, it's geo training um, system. And um, the grapes in 2019, so 2020 was a, um, a very variable, uh, difficult, challenging, I think they say, um, but quite warm uh, year. Um, 2019 was a little bit uh, cooler, um, but they did have um, thunderstorms and hail was a potential problem. But in this particular uh, crop, and this one, the grapes were healthy enough for them to do cold maceration for three days. Um, and then they had the fermentation and gentle pressing. Um, so uh, it may be slightly, I don't know, is it paler in color, but it's brighter. And there's a different a sort of spectrum of colors than the Matson. Um, lovely, lively nose, I'm going to compare it with the Matson, which seems to me a little bit more weightier, but mm, perhaps less expressive. Um, hmm, less lively, certainly. Um, okay, and a taste of the San Valentin. Um, this, this also is um, uh, getting the, the, the tannins. You say initially you've got a high acid, quite silky tannins. There's no um, stalkiness there. There's no, um, it's, it's fully ripe. Um, the oak I think is um, evident, aging in barrique. Um, and people are still experimenting um, a lot with this, but I think the general trend, if I can, call it like that, it, it would seem to be towards the larger uh, vessels. Um, and we're finding this all over the world, aren't we? But um, particularly in this area, they're using large, very old, um, you know, this is what they're aiming for, and they're creating more of them um, in order to achieve the same effect. So minimal amount of oak influence, but the wood aging is very important. Um, the grapes for this were harvested at the end of September. Um, so that was brought forward quite a bit because um, although it was a changeable year in the harvest season, it was actually quite warm towards the end um, and they needed to pick in, in between um, bits of rain. Um, so um, the yield on this is 45 hectolitres per hectare um, and I think there we've, we've got a sense of the liveliness and the phenolics. Um, the alcohol is 14%, but it, I feel it carries it fairly well. Um, you may disagree. Um, let's have a taste of the Matson next to it. 
see, I'm not getting as much so slightly more subdued, um, less vivacious aromas. Hmm. This is from their, their single vineyard, the Castle Feder. So the Matson is a single vineyard like their Grand Cru. Um, they owe three very important uh, vineyards of which this is one. Um, and it's in the possession of the Giovannette family um, since 1969. Um, they claim that they have a particular identity because of the clones. I'm afraid, I for, forgive me, but I was unable to discover what the particular special clones were. Um, but I believe them to be Burgundian, but I can't give you any more detail than that, I'm afraid. Um, and this has been um, grown with a northwest exposure. So it gets the evening light, but it's actually supposed to be slightly cooler. And yet um, the way I felt I was tasting it, it was a much heavier style. So the influence of altitude seemed to be very apparent um, on this combination. Um, uh, um, even though it was, um, you know, northwest facing, um, it's all again Gio, but they do have, this is a, a winery where they have actually kept some of their pergola um, and they're hoping to maintain it for as long as possible because of the shading uh, that I mentioned. Again, it's manual harvest and they did a slightly later, uh, oh no, beg your pardon, slightly earlier, of course, mid, mid September um, harvest. So. Um, the difference in the anthocyanins is something that I think is um, we're going to be looking at um, in greater detail over the next few years, I imagine. Um, you know, because the ultraviolet that is met, you know, is, dis is um, received at higher altitude um, and, and produces these flavonols, which protect the grape uh, varieties. But this non-flavonoid compound, the still bean with particularly the resveratrol, um, is, is just my little flag up. You know, you heard it here first. I mean, I'm not the first to say it, of course, but um, that, that I do think this is going to become an element in the way we look at wine and the way we taste wine and the way we sell wine. Um, it's going to become part of our lives. And the more we know about it, happily, I think, the better it will be, because resveratrol does seem to be a completely magic element. Anti-cancer, anti antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, cardioprotective, you know, there's almost nothing it doesn't seem to do. So, Sorry, Nancy, to interrupt. Is there a sheet, a, a sheet for the second Pinot? Oh, beg your pardon. That's all right. I just want to follow. Pro <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Excellent>. Thank you. <laughs> Too absorbed, absolutely. I think before you finish, Nan, uh, um, Wink was just saying that she's heard that there'd been a quite a bit of survey about res resveratrol, and apparently you needed to drink sort of two bottles or something before oh. it had effect. <laughs> so, a day um, to make a difference. Well, yeah. Um, Nancy, that that research is years old, although it so it may not be. You know, there may have been many surveys since, but it was yeah. literally twenty five years ago when I went uh, to New York State when they had were were it's the first time I ever heard of resveratrol uh, and they done they were terribly excited about it and then sometime after I discovered that you know really it was completely not possible uh, <laughs> for it to be vaunted as a health giving thing in wine because you needed to drink so much and in they were literally talking city. about making pills of it from right. from the grapes and so on or from, uh, and so on. But, but maybe that research has been superseded. It would be lovely well, if and, so. and and this is where the altitude element may just um, uh, change the dynamic a little bit because it seems that it in, increases. Um, uh, with altine. So this famous still beans that I, I, I cannot picture, but um, um, 
still beans, I'm just going to read you this because it doesn't make too much sense to me. Still beans are vine phytoalexins present in grape berries and associated with the beneficial effects of drinking wine. The principal still bean resveratrol is characterized by, as I mentioned, anti-cancer, etc. Um, and they occur in the grape and are synthesized by the vine as active defenses against exogenous attack. Um, and, and yeah, so I hear what you're saying. I think the reason why it's come up in the research that I've been doing is because there's a higher level. It doesn't mean to say it's high enough to be useful to us, but maybe it's it will start the conversation again. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, it's great. It's a great way to sell red wine, isn't it? So um, one doesn't want to be accused of misrepresentation. But on the other hand, you know, it's all part of the Mediterranean diet. You know, a good bit of red wine and olive oil and dark chocolate. I don't know if that came into it, but I'm going to put that in there as well. Um, and you're you're going to be buzzing with health. So yeah, Nancy, Nancy, we can enjoy being part of the research. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we should pool our, our findings. So anyway, I feel I really ought to stop there. And if there are any questions, I'd try to answer them. There's not not really that many questions. There's a few questions, but a lot of obviously Patricia Stavanovich has been providing a lot of support and comment and um, back up on a number of comments that you've made and your during your presentation as well. A quick question of from um uh uh, uh, somebody was asking if those mating sweeter styles of Gewurz in the region. Yes, oh, absolutely they are. Am I, should I stop sharing now? Or, yes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, absolutely yes. And how nice to see you all because I was talking to a screener and I, yeah, it's a rather odd experience, isn't it? Um, yes. And there are some amazing um, sweet dessert wines that they're producing, sometimes blended with Moscato Giallo. Um, and, uh, but I mean, sort of not quite my desert island wine, um, but really pretty sensational. Um, and I don't mean to single one out over others because there are plenty, but there's, there's, there is one producer that seems always to you know, hit above the average and it's Kurtach, it's uh, K-U-R-T-A-S-C-H. I hope I've got that right. Um, and they're not far from Chamin and uh, produce an amazing uh, pasito and yeah sweet so um it is it is a, a thing i think of worthy of you know others will do more research but gewurz far from being that one that grape that was always going to go flabby i thought when things hotted up um in this part of the world, at least, seems to be able to retain a lot of its integrity and, and acidity. And I'm happily going to do a lot more work in the field, <laughs> I think, on that, on that subject, because uh, the flavors are really very delicious. And, and maybe I'll have to come to Jura to do some more background research in, on Sauvignon as well, <laughs> just to... To, to round but it, out things. but it's not on high, at high altitude <laughs> no it's not but i mean one has to look at all facets of this <laughs> <laughs> good idea and i need to go to alto adige after two yes minutes. indeed well i couldn't recommend it more highly i mean uh, you know i've just mentioned about the wine but the the food is is incredible they've got more michelin starred places there than well than i, I think any other single region in Italy. I think I'm right in saying that. Yes, I can see Jessica nodding there. And um, uh, wonderful for summer hiking and mountain biking and brilliant for skiing, which is why, of course, it's got this, you know, the reputation of having the highest quality of life. You know, you're in the center of Bolzano, you look up, you can see the peaks, you can be up on the top of the ski lift in 40 minutes, I should imagine, from the center of town. Um, and that's what people do. So, um, you know, if you're not working on your little vineyard, and you're not in your office, you're going to be up on the mountain. Uh, That's because it's somewhat self-regulating, governing. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> Just true. a quick question. You mentioned that, because the whole cluster is sort of my little shoo-shoo subject, uh, that they're using, um, they're able to use whole cluster. Is it on anything other than Pinot, have you heard? Other varieties like mm, Schiava yeah. or not so much? 
Well, I do think they are doing that. Um, I'm, I'm on shaky ground here, but I do think they're doing that with some of the Pinot Bianco. I know that they're doing it with some of the other reds. So I haven't even mentioned the two indigenous grapes that they have, the Schiava and the Lagrine. And I know that um, Lagrine in particular is a grape that is of interest because it's sort of got quite a wide range of growing conditions. Um, but under healthy, with healthy grapes, they do use whole bunch fermentation to get a softening. It's a very deeply pigmented wine with potentially very high tannins. Um, I don't think I've really answered your question, but- No, it gives me just a little hint. That's, yeah. that's fine. As long as there's something else, I'll, I'll continue to do research. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and some of the, um, uh, I mean, the Mulaturga and uh, Sauvignon Blanc grown at high, I mean, really high altitude, you know, above a thousand meters, are just some of the most extraordinary uh, wines. I mean, I think, um, uh, Jessica will correct me if, it, or if I'm wrong, but um, uh, the Felt Maréchal from Tiefenbrunner um, is uh, uh, Müller Turgau, and I think it's the most memorable Müller I've ever tasted. Uh, and it, I mean, it has nuances and longevity and lively. I mean, just it, it, it just completely blew apart. Um, the rather workhorse uh, image I had of it um, previously. Um, but I should, um, before I go, I should, um, must mention um, uh, France Haas uh, as a, a winery because they've been looking into altitude almost before, yeah, well, certainly the earliest of most of the wineries. Um, and in the 1990s, they already were looking upwards um, to altitude and, and have some of the highest vineyards. Um, and they're available in the UK, and I hope also in South Africa and, and Switzerland, um, they're, they're more widely distributed um, and, and are very useful uh, indic uh, sort of ambassador, both for the range and the style and the different growing conditions that you can encounter. And I should also mention our Lois Lageda probably haven't pronounced that properly, but um, because of their research into other grapes, um, old heritage grapes and some hybrid, um, their heritage grape, oh, they've done several and I won't remember all of them, Blatterly is one which I think you might be familiar with, and then a Souvenir Gris is another one, and they, they produce them in small tiny quantities under their comet line um, so if you went onto their website and looked under the comet as an asteroid and you know, astronomical things, um, you would find them. And, and that's their sort of research program. Um, well, I think, I think there's, there has been another, there's a few other questions there, Nancy, but I'm aware that obviously we're sort of quarter to 12 now, some people are starting to leave. Yeah. Um, if there are questions that haven't been answered, I know, um, Robin, there might be one or two there. If you want to put them through to me and I'll send them or you can email direct to Nancy. Um, and a number of people have asked for a copy of the presentation and any stockists that maybe you could, you or Jessica can provide. Right. That would be really, really helpful. But In the um, UK, yeah. Yeah, well, no, we've got a number of members, also circle members, who are also based in Europe. So yeah, that sort of information would be. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll know. just say it here, just so. But um, one of the ones that is based in Italy but can supply all over is Tanico. Um, you may have come across them, and and um, but it does take time. I mean, two weeks, I think, is a, a sort of usual mail order one. From my side, it's been a fascinating talk, and I think we all probably need some abscisic acid, don't we, to relieve the stress? <laughs> so, uh, but I know that Nina probably wants to say um, a thank you if she is still here. I am still here. I was just, yeah. Nancy, honestly, I, I can't remember the last time I listened to somebody who gave so much brilliant technical detail. I just, I just wanted to, I wanted to just listen to you. Oh, you <laughs> so it's like, it was fantastic, and and I definitely want to be part of that acidity. Uh, yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. Genuinely, I, you know, we all talk about altitude and soils, and I just thought it was so fascinating actually seeing the differences between the acidities in those grape varieties from from that region. Honestly, I'm fascinated. I just want yeah. to know more now. 
Well, great. Well, I, I've been there. I know the region. I know the region. I've been there several times, and I just they were they were just it was beautiful. Really, and you just make me want to go back. It really is. <laughs> it's just an extraordinary thing where so much is encapsulated yeah. in such a tiny space. Yeah. So many variables to play with. Mm. Great playground for wine wine people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, and thank you very much, Nancy, on behalf of the Association of Wine Educators and the Circle of Wine, Ed Wine Writers. This was a joint effort and it's great collaborating between the two organisations today. And it's great to have so many people here. So thank you very much to Nancy and also to Jessica. Thank you.